Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Uh, welcome back to students. So happy that you're here. Let's welcome our student community back to church this Sunday. Yes. Awesome. I hope you have a wonderful semester. Let's stand together and worship our God, uh, lifting our hearts, our voices to just say, God, we want to bless you. We want to praise you together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship his holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new That's beautiful. Way to go. Way to worship. I love that. It sounds awesome. And higher than the mountains that I face. 
soak into your heart this morning the steadfast never failing love of God you know I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of things that change in your life maybe the next few weeks or few months uh, things constantly are changing but the steadfast love of God never fails never leaves us and there's still uh, too many people too many places in this world that um, don't have that kind of light in their life, maybe like we get to enjoy. So I just want to give you a moment of uh, some, really just meditation on some scriptures this morning. I'm mindful today is the 15th anniversary of uh, 9-11, September 11th, and uh, I just encourage us to kind of in a prayerful way stand in solidarity with all those that still suffer. Uh, from that and still suffer those kinds of things in the world, even if we may not hear about it in the news. And just kind of praying the steadfast love of God into their lives and our hearts. So I'm just going to read a few verses that kind of remind us of God's presence with us, encourage us to trust in God. And though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 23. For God alone my soul in silence waits. 
Psalm 119. And steadfast love is yours, O Lord. Psalm 62. And you are precious in my sight. And I love you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Isaiah 43. And seek first the kingdom of God, God's righteousness, God's way. Do not worry about tomorrow. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew 6, 33. And so, God, will you open our lips, open our hearts to declare your praise and your love this morning, to put our trust in your steadfast love, no matter the circumstances that we may face.
we sometimes say, God, where are you? But I think really the question is, needs to probably be reversed. God, where am I? How can I be more present to you and more aware of how you're already at work in my life and in the world? Amen. So thank you so much for worshiping. You may be seated this morning. I want to welcome you this morning. It's so good to hear all your voices. You guys are good singers. Did you know that? You really are. You, you're all on the worship team. That's how I think of it. It's not really the team. It's we're just kind of helping facilitate, and really you're the, you're the choir that's worshiping Jesus. So great job. Uh, I want to ask you to grab a Connect card, if you'd be so kind. They're in the pew right in front of you. Uh, you can use the inside portion of your bulletin as well. It's an opportunity for you to get connected here at the church, especially if you're a visitor, if you're a guest, please fill one of those out. You can stick it in the offering plate when it comes by in just a little bit. And so we just want to invite you to do that. It's a great opportunity to be part of a church family, uh, serve in ministry, uh, those kind of things. I do want to mention, if you're interested in getting involved on any of the teams on Sunday morning, uh, maybe during the week is tough for you, but Sunday morning you can be here. You can serve on the hospitality team, media team, worship team. You can play an instrument in the ensemble at the classic service or sing in the choir, whatever you're thinking. Will you see me after the service? I'd love to connect with you about that. Uh, as we did already, but I'm sure more folks came in uh, since then, we want to welcome our student community. We're so excited to have... Uh, our students back on campus this semester. We're just uh, really excited about that. So we're going to be watching a video in just a moment to, um, yeah, just welcome you back. So let's watch this video. semester. My name is Josh. I'm the student pastor here at First Baptist, and we're just so excited because this weekend is the launch of our campus ministry uh, with all the students who are getting back and everything. Uh, we're just so excited for what this semester holds for you uh, college students. That video was made last year, just kind of a summary of some of the things that we did. You could see in that video different glimpses of our campus ministry. That's uh, on-campus small groups, retreats, agape nights, community events. Uh, we have a lot going on during the year. Uh, and so we just invite you, if you are a new student or you're looking to just get involved in a student community of faith, uh, please come and, and check with myself, check with one of the interns this year. We've got a lot of information in the back today, ways for you to find out our schedule, our calendar, and get involved. We're also going to take this opportunity to kind of commission and introduce this year's interns. Uh, these are students who graduated. Every year we've been so blessed to have students who have graduated and committed a year of full-time ministry. Bless the college ministry here at First Baptist. So I want to give Paul and Nana a chance to introduce themselves this morning. Hi, my name is Paul. I'm from the Boston area, and I just recently graduated from UMass Amherst. One thing I'm looking forward to this year is really just to serve with my brothers and sisters and to really see them grow and uh, bring in new people and grow the community. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nana, and I'm originally from Ghana and West Africa. Um, I graduated from Mount Holyoke in May, 
And I am really excited about getting to know people this year um, and growing closer to God and then helping others grow closer to God. Yeah. So please do come find one of us today to learn more about the college ministry. Also, uh, there is a barbecue after this service, so make sure to stick around and get some free food downstairs. Um, we'll, we'll see what the weather situation is, but there's definitely going to be food somewhere. Uh, so come on downstairs after service. Uh, as we prepare for this morning's offering and just to commission Paul and Nana and to prepare for this semester, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for the chance that we have as one community to come together in worship. We're thankful for the new students that are here in the valley, the returning students who are coming home to this community. And Lord, we ask that you would be the one that goes before us into this semester. Father, we ask that you would bless new students, those that are looking for a faith community, a church home, that you would bless the interns as they endeavor to serve and to minister to so many people here at the different campuses, and that you would be with us as a church to be welcoming and to be one body in the midst of all our diversity. Uh, would you help us to be unified under your name, Jesus? Bless this offering that we give uh, now. Make these gifts just be an act of worship to you as we seek to make your name known, to make you famous, and to bring you glory in this area where we have been called uh, to bless your name. We thank you and ask that you would be with us in worship. Open our hearts for what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name.
let's give God a hand of praise. Amen, church. Good morning, church. Will you join me in our scripture reading? In 1 Thessalonians, you can find it on page 1169 in your blue pew Bibles. We're reading 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 10. Again, page 1169. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, do not, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The word of the Lord. Well, welcome to the fall season, and that means a welcome back to all the college students who are coming back to campus for the new semester. It means a lot of families are back from vacations, it means kids are off to school, and it really feels like kind of a new beginning, doesn't it? And so there's a lot of optimism, and that's good. But I also want us to ask, what will be happening in our lives at the end of the semester? You know, all of us enter with great optimism, but will this be a semester where we'll make wise decisions? Or will we make stupid choices that will cause wreckage in our lives? Will our heart's affection grow with love for God? Or will we allow our hearts to go astray and wander into temptations that will cause pain and hurt and damage for our lives? Will we continue on a healing journey where we'll allow uh, Christ's love and God's grace to bring transformation to, to the brokenness that we experience? Or will we just continue on in our brokenness, masking over the pain that we're experiencing and pretending everything is okay? No one begins a semester or a new chapter of life saying, I think this is going to be the semester when I'm going to wander into temptations and cause wreckage in in my life. This is going to be a semester when I'm going to have broken relationships. This is going to be the semester that I'm going to regret. None of us walk into it that way. And yet the truth is, how often do we reflect back on seasons of our lives? So I think the challenge for us is to be intentional. Because nothing in our lives that that we accomplish or that we achieve or or, or how we grow doesn't happen with intentionality. And I think that means we really need to comprehend how God changes lives and to understand how God brings inward transformation that we long to experience that isn't a superficial spirituality, but is a real, genuine, heart affection transformation. So will you join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1? We're going to begin in verse 4. So please join uh, either in your own Bible or the blue Bibles in front of you. It's on page 1169. And let's either join in your Bible, the the blue Bible in front of you, or look at the person next to you Bible. If they give you kind of a weird look, then just sit on the other side next week, okay? It's all going to be fine. You know, we often hear a lot of sermons, and when they're about spiritual growth, we normally hear, man, we need to pray more, we need to read the Bible more, we need to go to church more, we need to serve more, we need to give more. And those are good things, but those are really things we do. But how does God transform us from the inside out? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the author, the Apostle Paul, reflects with this church in Thessalonica, today's Thessaloniki, and reminds them of how God has changed their life. 
And we begin in verse 4 with really what transformation hinges on, the first thing, and that is God's love. Verse 4, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that God has chosen you. Isn't it fascinating that the author says, we know? This is confidence. How can we have that kind of confidence that we're loved? Because we live in a world where we have to choose whether we love or not, right? We're kind of fallen people, so there's often wrestling within us. Am I going to act in love or am I going to act self-centered? Am I entering this relationship really out of what I'm going to get out of it or because I really love this person? Am I going to lash out in anger because of what this person's done to me or am I going to learn to still stand my ground but with love? See, because we're fallen, we choose rather or not we love. But God doesn't have to make the choice to love. Because God is love. There's no darkness, there's no fallenness within God. Matter of fact, God can't help himself but to passionately love us. Now, God's heart may be broken because of some of the decisions that we're making, but God passionately loves each one of us. Let me help to bring this to life. Rick and Marvelina live in Gig Harbor, Washington. Years ago, when their children were young, they went skiing together, and it was a beautiful day of skiing, and as they were coming back down off the mountain, uh, their vehicle slipped on ice and went uh, off of the highway, rolled down hen embankment, and wrapped around a tree. Rick then, who had a pretty significant concussion, came to, he had his senses about him, and what he saw would forever change his life because he saw that in the shattering of glass, shards of glass were embedded all over Marvelina's face. He took his crew neck and he tied it around her face to help to, to stop the bleeding. It took almost 40 minutes for rescue vehicles to come. In the hospital, they put 52 stitches in her face. As the time began to pass, for the first time she looked at herself in the mirror and she gave a look to Rick of just helplessness. Their children, their then two, two young children, were afraid of mommy because of all the swelling, the bruising, the stitches. Several weeks passed, and, and they were sitting at their dining room table after the children had fallen asleep. And Marvelina asked the question. She said, Rick, are you going to stick around? What a powerful moment. Imagine what Rick could have said. You know, it is kind of embarrassing to go out in public with you. You know, they, you don't look at all like the woman who I married. You know, my hopes and dreams are gone. That's not what he said. What he said to her, I'll never forget. He said, the package may have changed a little bit, but I didn't marry the package. I married the person. And who you are today is more beautiful to me than ever. They've been married 37 years. They've raised their three children and, and through some minor reconstructive surgeries, a beautiful life together. You know, I think what Rick was expressing was really a godly love because we live in a culture that's all about the package, don't we? It's the package of our education or our job success or our socioeconomics or our race or our background or you know, a myriad of things of how we know we size each other up in our culture. It's about the package so often. And yet God wants us to break through the package and to know that God passionately, wildly loves us and pursues us as his kids, even his lost, broken, damaged children who he longs to come back home to himself. We cannot understand the gospel without understanding that even though we may feel that we're scarred and marred and wounded because of sin, and brokenness and guilt that God breaks through with a passionate love for you and me, an unconditional love. It's not about the package or our performance. It's just because we're his kids. Amen? But God's love was put into action because love is not only a feeling, a sentiment, and an emotion. Love is a verb. Love is an action. So God put God's love in action by bringing to us the gospel. Look at verse 5. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power. 
This word gospel is a theological word, but it's actually pretty foundational. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which simply means good news. I wish more often rather than saying gospel, we'd say good news because it's a little more unpacked. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. How we live in a world that's longing for good news, huh? And the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ really centers around one thing above all else, and that's the cross. That even though we had wandered astray from God because of our sin and our brokenness, that God chose to come in person in Christ to reveal to us who God the Father really is so we would know who God is, and then he sacrificed his life on the cross so that instead of religiously striving by experiencing enough religious rituals or by praying enough or by suffering enough or by giving enough or somehow merging our God consciousness with the universe that we would somehow reach God. But instead, the gospel is that Christ has in an all-sufficient way sacrificed his life to atone for our sins and take God's wrath, which is God's justice that we deserve. I deserve God's judgment. But instead, it's been put on Christ. And then we invite Christ into our lives. We choose to follow Christ. We repent of our sins. All of our sin and that filth is taken by Jesus on the cross. Imagine Jesus on the cross. What it must have been been to physically suffer such extreme pain, to emotionally know that, that he had been abandoned and, and that he was separated from his holy heavenly Father, and that all the sin and the guilt and the filth of the world was heaped upon him. That's the gospel. And here's why it's so transformative, because religion doesn't motivate us very well. Religion so often means that I am striving to do something to get to God. And I either go to bed at night and I wonder, am I in? Is it 51-49? Is it 80-20? Is it on a curve? Who I hope so because I'm doing better than a few of you, right? Or is it 100%? And so we go to bed at night with this fear like, I don't know. Or we become holier than thou. And we achieve religiously and we think we're superior to other people and that's how religious wars begin. But the gospel rightly understood is that when we humbly empty ourselves and give it all up to Jesus, that Christ takes our sin. And then our motivation is not to check the religious boxes, but to say, God, thank you that you went to the cross in Christ to atone your life for me May my life now reflect your love and your gospel to the world around me. Amen? But there's a power that comes with the gospel. It's not just the written word. It's not just the preached word. It's not just the discussed word. But there is a power that comes. Uh, and that power comes from the Holy Spirit. I, I want to remind us of something critically important. You know, FBC is not about like fog machines on the stage where I run out in the introduction or slick ad campaigns or about health and wealth gospel where we give a therapeutic deism so you go home feeling like, oh, I know the five steps to be successful now. We don't align with a lot of political power thinking somehow we're going to bring Christianity. You know, we are a gospel-centered church where we want everyone to have the gospel incarnated, that the gospel will be seen and felt and experienced as we learn to love and serve and, and have conviction and pursue justice and as we clearly communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power for transformed living. And that power comes as evoked by the Holy Spirit. Continue in verse 5. This power comes with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. The Holy Spirit's job description is to confirm truth for us. Have you ever had a time when you're listening to a sermon, you're reading scripture, you're, you're discussing in a Bible study, and it was like God's Spirit just kind of confirmed, yeah, that's truth. That's what I'm, I, I'm talking to you. Or times when the Holy Spirit convicts us, where, where we have that sense of conviction. Now remember, the Holy Spirit never convicts us to condemn us but always to change us and bring us back home. I don't know how often when people have uh, 
preached at First Baptist, whoever might be preaching on that Sunday. And I hear people say, you know, it was like you spoke into my life. Just today, someone came out and said, it seemed like you were reading my emails, okay? Don't worry, okay? I'm not reading your emails. But what that is is that every time um, for Sunday worship or for growth groups or for salt classes or for meeting with someone pastorally, my prayer always is, God, help me to be diligent to do what you faithfully called me to do. But God, by your spirit, what you do, what I could never manufacture. See, I can probably guilt you a little bit into maybe behavior modification for a short time, but I can't change your life. But I can help introduce us to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit begins to evoke transformation within us. Amen? And so that transformation can come uh, only really from God's Holy Spirit. Right now, God's Holy Spirit is working within us confirming truth, convicting us, cheering on where we're obedient, nudging us, calling us, moving us, shaping us more like Christ. Here's the real question for this semester. It's a challenging question. Will we be so busy that we won't create space? Well, I'm talking to myself here. Will we be too busy to have space for, for the Holy Spirit, for us to just listen? Will we slow down and just listen? God, what how, how do you want to speak to me? How do you want to move me? What, will we create space to slow down? To listen when God's Holy Spirit, in a variety of ways, wants to speak to us and bring transformation to our lives. Well, the fourth and kind of the final resource that we learn how God changes lives from the inside out is through community. Verse 5. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. It, what an amazing thing that the Apostle Paul and those writing with him could say, remember, you know how we lived among you. Could we say that? To a watching world, to the people we, we share life with, could we say, you know how we've lived and how you've seen Christ in and through us. That's powerful. And it's, it's so challenging for us. But when we begin to allow God's grace to work in our lives, I think that that witness can be magnified around us. You know, reflect for a minute and think about people that God has positioned in your life. I can just name a litany of people that God positioned in my life at different times who I saw the gospel, I saw who Christ was, through their life, through God's grace on display in their lives. An example of this comes, uh, so this last week, uh, I was away in Seattle visiting my family. Uh, my sister Kathy, and I have permission to share this, who's five years younger than I am, just a kid. So she, um, she uh, did not grow up with the gospel. None of us, you know, in our home grew up in a wonderfully supportive home, but who God was, I had no idea. I used to wonder, like, why, why do people talk about Jesus? Does God get, get, get offended at that? I mean, I had no idea anything spiritual. And then first my brother came to Christ, and then he spent time talking with me, kind of three years of really wrestling with my own brokenness and with the intellectual tenability, and, and I committed my life to Christ. And then we began to have some conversations with, with Kathy, and it was like hard as cement. She, she, she's had no interest. Then a couple years later, we were visiting uh, the family home, and she had like this big study Bible out, and she was marking it up, and she was going to church, and she was starting to date this great Christian guy who now she's married to. They've been married for years. They have three children who are all uh, in ministry. You know, amazing transformation. And so I finally asked her, you know, Kathy, what, what happened how did God get a hold of your life? This is what she said, your wedding. And I thought, my wedding? I don't remember streams of people coming, giving their lives to Christ at my wedding. How did this happen? She said, well, the, the bridal party, all of us spent three days together. We spent the whole weekend together. And she said, I, and, and the, the, the majority of our wedding party were Christ followers. They were our good friends. And she said, I've never seen people interact that way and, and care for each other like that. And, 
And then one of my friends, Matt, probably three or four times drove up to the Seattle area just to visit her, to kind of date her a little bit, but nothing developed. And she said, I, I've never had a guy like treat me like that. So when she got back to college for her sophomore year, she looked for people like that. She found what's called the Inn at Western Washington University, which is a campus ministry, and experienced a transformed life. See, community. Community can be so transformative. And let me challenge us this semester not to live our faith alone. We live, one of the challenges of our generation is that we can be surrounded by people and we can be on social media, but we can still be very isolated, alone, and vulnerable. I'm not talking about community like, yeah, there's a lot of people moving around my life. That's not the kind of community we're talking about. But where we intentionally get together with some people who are Christ followers, and we speak into each other's lives, and we share with each other, and we learn and we grow together. I do this with two different pastors, one once a week, the other once a month, and then a community of about 18 pastors all over New England. I don't know how often I think I come to Friday or one of these larger gatherings, and honestly, I'm like, I'm going to send a text. I, I, I'm just too busy. And it's like, mm, I know I need to go. And afterwards, I'm just so grateful for that community because I need that to keep me from wandering astray, to keep me growing, to keep me having insights. As a matter of fact, you're blessed by that because some of those pastors, when we get together and we're wrestling you know, with things, a lot of the learnings from that I bring to you. And so will we be too busy to be in some kind of intentional faith community where that will leave us vulnerable and lonely? However we connect in community, it needs to be intentional. Rather, it's gathering regularly with friends, rather it's through, through the FBC college ministry, rather it's through the different campus ministries on the different campuses, growth groups, you know, salt class, whatever it is that in community we're growing together. Can we make that pledge that we'll be in community and we won't let busyness create the vulnerability of isolation? Well, what was the impact of this for these people 2,000 years ago, change lives. Let's wrap it all up. Look at verse 7. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, and the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. No, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Oh, this is, this is one of those verses that I would love to hear God say to me. Wouldn't it be awesome for God to say, you, your life is a model of Christ. Your faith is known are all around your campus and your community. Amen? What, it, what, what, what could we really cherish more? And we read that the message rang out. The word rang is the English translation of what the Apostle Paul originally wrote in Koine Greek, exeketai, and it literally means something that's amplified. In the context of the ancient world, the Greco-Roman world, it would be like when a trumpet sound or in an amphitheater where the sound was then accentuated. Here's the point. Isn't it easy for us sometimes to think, how could my faith make any difference? I'm just living my faith. It doesn't have any kind of influence with anything else, with anyone. But God, by God's Holy Spirit, will take our witness and will ring it out, will amplify it beyond what we ever could have. I had no idea. You know, I didn't get together with my guy say, hey, you know, my sister's coming, so we need to put on that Christian thing for her, okay? We were just living our lives. And through that, her life was transformed. I pray that, that as God is changing our lives, and let's remember, the most powerful witness of our faith isn't perfection. You know people who look perfect? I don't know about you, but I almost sometimes look at them sadly like, I know that's not real, right? You see, people aren't, aren't looking for something that pretends to be perfect. What our world is hungry for is authenticity. And to see someone whose life is being changed, someone who, who God's grace is changing someone's life. Several years ago, my mother met two of my high school friends. Uh, and uh, they, they were having a conversation, and they asked my mom, so, so what's Greg doing? And she said, well, why don't you guess? 
Okay, one of them said he's an attorney because he could really argue well, okay? And the other said, oh, he's like a high school teacher and coach. At least none of them said, I think he's probably in prison, okay? That's good. <laughs> so then my mom said, no, guess what? He's a minister at a church. And she said, both of them said, no way. <laughs> God's grace, amen? God's grace is when real life people are being, when someone who used to be kind of a jerk is now only a little bit of a jerk <laughs> and is now learning to love and have compassion and care for others and serve, amen? So what will this semester bring? I pray that we'll be intentional. You know, we only really experience real change with intentionality, not just intention, but intentionality in action. You know, the only way that we lose weight is not when we say, oh, I think I'm going to lose weight, and then you come to the end of the semester, what happens? Nothing. It's when we're intentional about it, trust me. All right? Or, or if we want to learn an instrument or we have kind of goals academically, if we just have intentions, it's not going to happen. It's when we intentionally take. What will be the intentional next steps that we'll take that will help us at the end of the semester to be able to say, ah, oh, this was a season where my heart's affection grew in love with God. Amen? Father, we give you thanks that you're the God who so loves us. We're saturated with your love. And because of your love, we don't need to do those geeky, stupid, or sometimes dangerous things to try to impress other people. We can just be who you created us to be. God, thank you for the gospel that Jesus came to earth and sacrificed himself so that we who are astray from you can come back home, not through our human effort to somehow achieve, but instead in response to your atonement on the cross. Father, thank you that your Holy Spirit is within us to empower us to be and become and live in ways we never imagined. And Father, help us now. Reveal to us in these days to come what we can intentionally do to take a next step of trusting you and of shaping our lives to be more like Christ. Guide us in this, we pray in the beautiful and powerful and shepherding name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. In this time of desperation,
pray that we will believe. And the good news is that the church should be the safest place on earth for us to wrestle with faith and doubt, brokenness and healing, and coming more deeply to trust Jesus, the Savior of our souls. So I pray that we will go out as a gospel-centered, Christ-centered people, reflecting Christ's light in a world filled with too much darkness in need of hope. Praise, glory, and honor be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen, and enjoy some good food at the banquet.